Good, go. Okay, so we talked to you about what the Research Associates Program was about. We talked to you a little bit about NARAP and about how you are at a particular junction, a start of something that could be really big. We've talked to you about tobacco cessation and hopefully motivated you to the idea that you are going to be doing something that's going to be really special in terms of being able to help lots of people to stop something which has high morbidity and mortality, to prevent all those nasty slides that you saw uh, for that uh, tobacco cessation didactic material. The next step that I have to do is to convince you that we have laid the foundation through studies we have done to where you are going to be involved in the national multicenter study for this tobacco cessation, facilitating tobacco cessation in the emergency department, and see how this perpetuated over time can change how we provide primary health care in the United States in a bigger way. Okay. So now we're going to talk about the data. We're going to talk about the studies. And this is the, the progression of a series of studies that we've done, starting here at St. Vincent's, expanding in Connecticut, and now expanding nationally, that looks at how a workforce, research associates, who have a motivation to uh, come to the emergency department and, and, and work that is uh, in their self-interest, that that applied on a larger scale can be successful. Okay, so what do you do? You started with a pilot study, right? Start small. We started here at St. Vincent's. And at St. Vincent's, using a scripted format, and I want to emphasize this. I mean, this is about doing it the same way every time over the next year, right? We did the same way the same time, same way each time over two semesters in this one. Um, and I'll use the example of Amway. Some of you may know what Amway is, some not. Amway is basically a, it's a, it's a soap and cleaner company that has marketing done by people who use scripts. Multi-billion dollar business. They do pretty well using scripts. How many people here, at, and I'm going to have hands around the country, how many people here have been telemarketed, have had a telemarketer call them on the telephone? Anybody? Oh, God, everybody, right? We've all had that. Pain in the neck, blah, 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 right? They don't do that because it doesn't work. They do it because it does work. They're using a script. Now, I'm not saying we're telemarketers, please, right? We have higher motivation than that. But the other is to do it the same way every time. As clinical research, you have to use a scripted format. We want you to ask the same question the same way every time. Same question in Texas that's asked in Washington, that's asked in upstate New York, that's asked in Connecticut. And we want you to concentrate not on what to say, but on how to say it. We want you to concentrate on the development of your personal interactive skills with people who are sick in their families. Okay? And better for you, you got more, you got a lot of other things to memorize and remember. Right? Memorize it one time and then come to the emergency department a week later and you've forgotten it again. So this is all done by scripts. Brian King's going to go over all of that with you, but we want you to, we used a scripted format and it worked. They approached as many patients and visitors in the emergency department as they possibly could during their four hour shift. Keep it simple. That's all you got to do. Now, in some, of your, in some of the programs around the country, it's going to be you have other studies you're doing as well, whatever the protocols are that you have. But basically, when you're doing the tobacco study, whatever that format is in your institution, go see as many people as you can. That's in your self-interest. You should want to see as many sick people as you possibly can for the three reasons, discernment, qualification, and personal development, as you possibly can. Okay. They're using a, the verbal assent or written consent based on our, our study. We basically, the first semester was a informed, written informed consent. The second was verbal assent. We'll go into those pieces as well. They took a detailed tobacco history, just like a doctor does, just like you're going to learn, learn to do as a medical student. They walked in using a script. They asked a detailed series of questions about somebody's use of tobacco. And if they, the person had uh, uh, used tobacco uh, for more than 30 days in their life, they were offered a quitline referral. 
Why do we do it that way? Um, you say, wait a second, somebody that that's, hasn't smoked in 20 years, why are we asking them if they wanted a quit line referral? Um, one, because nicotine is defined as a lifelong addiction. Talk to somebody who stopped smoking, say to them, listen, you know, if you could start again tomorrow, no harm, no foul, right? No health consequences or anything else, would you do it? Absolutely, right? It is as addictive as heroin. Who wouldn't like to have that if it didn't hurt them, right? So we're gonna help them not do that. So it's offered to everybody. The other is you couldn't find a cutoff. And what's the worst that happens? Somebody that's asked to have, that's not smoked for 20 years, they say no. We were surprised at how many people who had long-term, said they had, had not smoked in a long time, who still wanted a quit line referral to reinforce, I don't want to go back. The temptation is there, what can I do to help with that? So what we find? In a short period of time, 21 weeks, 63 RAs approach 4,600 plus patients, potential participants in the emergency department, patients and visitors. Those of you who have been in an emergency department, think of what it would be like for clinicians over that kind of a time frame to ask 4,600 plus people, in addition to what they were doing to take care of their needs they came to the emergency department for, asked about their smoking history as well and went through the process of getting them a uh, quit line referral. Wouldn't happen. About 88% were eligible. That is, they didn't have exclusion criteria. They were uh, awake, alert, able to speak, spoke English, because that's how we had to do it in terms of referrals uh, and in terms of, of uh, callbacks, uh, which we were doing at that time. The uh, number of other things that we'll go over to you about specifically and inclusion, exclusion criteria from the study. Of those who were eligible, they enrolled 78%. Well, that's good, right? That's a lot. The enemy of good is perfect. 100% never going to happen. But 78% is a substantial percentage. 22% just said no. Thanks, but no thanks, right? I don't want to do that. Fine. No harm, no foul. Okay? Part of the research process is you are not coerced into being part of the research. If you want to do it, fine. Okay? So that's that. We were very pleased with that number. And if they had a smoking history, they referred to the Connecticut quit line, as we've talked about, a free telephone-based, uh, uh, very effective means of helping people to stop smoking, stop using tobacco. 54% used tobacco at some time in their life for more than 30 days, so over half. Why we were happy with this number is because in the state of Connecticut, uh, demographic information that is available to the government says somewhere a little over 50% of people have smoked at some time in their life. 22% had smoked within the last 30 days. And in Connecticut, again, 20 to 25% of people have, uh, will say that they have smoked within the last 30 days. And so what you have is that concept of if half the U.S. population goes to an emergency department, no different in Connecticut, then this is representative of the population at large. Right? So that's good for the research side of things. If you smoked at any time during your life, one in five, about, would accept a quit line referral, 18%. We were like, wow, hey, this didn't cost any money. This didn't cost anybody anything. It was good for the RAs because they were getting patient contact, patient, you know, able to see patients. And these people were being asked, and 18%, one in five, were saying, yes, I'd like to have help stopping this, using tobacco. What was even better? was that the real target population, right, in honesty, what are you really after? You're after the active smokers, those who have smoked within the last 30 days. That is within the last seven days, which we consider to be active smokers, right? If they were sick, they probably stopped, they could have stopped smoking, but they really wish they could, right? You got a cough and bronchitis, maybe you, you don't smoke for a while, uh, right before you go to the emergency department. Or you're in the active, I want to quit mode, which is the first 30 days, almost four in 10 accepted a quit line referral. We were like, four in 10? Because a college student, well, you can't say cuts. Associated with a college student walking in and saying, hi, my name's Keith Bradley, I'm the Emergency Medicine Research Associate today, blah, 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 right? And asking about their tobacco use and offering a quit line referral. 
That was over 50% of all the quitline referrals in the entire state of Connecticut during that time frame, during those 21 weeks. Wasn't from doctor's offices, wasn't from clinics, wasn't from hospitals, wasn't from any, wasn't from other emergency departments, it was from the St. Vincent's Emergency Department, over 50%, or about 50%. So the next step you do, right, so hey, maybe it's just because it's St. Vincent's, you know, we're all psyched and we're, we're gung-ho about all this stuff. Maybe it's just here. Maybe we, it won't go anywhere else. You do a validation study. We did it at three hospitals around Connecticut, same study design. We used REDCap. We used a uh, database collection system that Vanderbilt University has that's available. It's actually, there are, there are 150, I think, somewhere in that range, uh, hospitals around the world that use this system for multicenter studies, cancer studies and, you know, regular, all kinds of clinical studies. We used it for here because at three hospitals, you could have people entering data and don't ask me how because it's way, way above my pay grade. But you enter the data, hit the enter button, and it goes up to a cloud. Cloud in the sky somewhere and gets collected on a database that we can download and analyze. How great is this, right? So from a research point of view, it's terrific. And RedCap allows us to put in so that all the questions, all the things we ask are able to be put in italics on one side so you can read them word for word. Okay? You're going to hear that over and over today. Read it word for word. Best we possibly can. Okay. So that St. Vincent's still in the study. Hartford Hospital, a hospital that's different than, than, uh, than, than St. Vincent's, right? A major tertiary care center that's been a long time uh, uh, clinical site for the U University of Connecticut School of Medicine. And, you know, every specialty known, lots of research, all kinds of other stuff like that. Inner city as well. <coughs> and then Lawrence Memorial Hospital, a small community hospital, great care, small area in uh, eastern uh, Connecticut, right? So we have not only community hospital, big tertiary hospital, and something kind of in between here at St. Vincent's, but the generalizability of what we do then gets higher. So we beta tested this stuff, right? We had to have people practice on uh, REDCap. And then in the spring, summer, and fall semesters of 2011, we did the validation study. We redid the pilot study. Now in general, kind of routine, right? You do a pilot study at a place that's really psyched about doing it, right? So the numbers are generally the best. And when you do a validation study, what you really want to know is how far are those numbers going to fall off? They're going to fall off. You just hope that it's not very much, right? If it goes down too much, then you know the answer was, yeah, it's great at place A, but nobody else can do this, right? So in this study, we actually had 7,800 participants in 30 weeks were in this study, right? 7,800. We don't have all the data up for here because it's still being analyzed. But what we found was that the percentages in the demographics were pretty much the same. 50% have been smokers, about 20 some odd percent had been smoking within the last 30 days. What we didn't expect was that the quit line referrals, especially for our target group, our real group of interest, which is those who have smoked within the last 30 days, active smokers, went from 38% to about 50 to 55%. More than half. If you smoke cigarettes and you came to the St. Vincent's Emergency Department and a research associate asked you if you wanted a quit line referral, more than half the time you said yes. I want help to stop smoking. It's like, holy buckets. This could really work. Now, we don't have the final analysis of data Come back to us next semester. The slide will be much better. It will have all the numbers and will look good, the graphs and everything else. The, uh, that's what chief research associates do. They, they fix all that stuff up. The, uh, but we were really excited. And since with REDCap, you can look at the data basically second by second if you want, 
Patrick, you're way too far away. I can't see what that says. So. 15 minutes? We're, way, we're, we're real good. Um, we're, um, we'll, have nice, we'll have nice slides, better slides than this one. We can analyze the data a little better. But that's the big number. That's the big number. So you're still, when you go into the emergency department, you're going to have times when you're going to more than, you know, 50 some odd percent of the time you're going to identify a smoker and they're going to say no. That's okay. No harm, no foul. No pressure, no nothing. It's a study. It is still a time when somebody in a healthcare environment has said, identified somebody as a smoker, offered them help with their smoking. They have said no this time, but it increases the chances they'll say yes the next time. Okay, next, yes the next time. So now we go to the national study. Now we come to today, where we have the National Alliance of Research Associate Programs. 15, actually 14 now, academic community hospitals around the country. Big ones, little ones, academic centers, hospitals in rural areas, all different kinds, big cities, suburbs, different places. Because we want the information to be generalizable to as many emergency departments and their surrounding colleges as we possibly can. Right? This is looking, in a way, this is looking at the entire U.S. population. Right? In, 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 area, in, in various sections in various places. 2012, 30 weeks. Basically, RAs commit to, in general, each program having its own specifics. But in general, what we can say is about 10 weeks in a semester that you're, you know, 10 shifts, four hours each, done by well over 500 research associates, right? The Tom Sawyer rule. And we think that this is going to enroll, the target for this is to enroll somewhere north of 70,000 participants. 70,000 participants. This could be the largest interventional clinical study that's ever been done in a short time period. And you're part of it. And you're an integral part of it. Without you, it doesn't happen. Okay? Now, that's, ah, that's great, right? Great research. Great for pay. If I'm sitting in your shoes, right, I'm sitting here today and long ago was, I'd be asking myself, so, okay, what's in it for me? And I think that's good. I think you should be asking that. And I want you to put yourself in that position of, the, uh, of, of uh, going to that medical school interview. And they say, what have you done to prepare yourself to be a doctor? And you say, well, Dr. Bradley, I was part of the largest prospective interventional clinical trial that had ever been done in a short time period. I think that's going to make for some interesting interview discussions. So again, I want you to see how this is in your self-interest, okay? For discernment, qualification, development, and that interview. Okay, I want you to see that. Thoughts, questions, issues. <coughs> hey, I'm done for the day. I'm going to be actually, we'll all be working here as your program directors and your, and your chief RAs will be working well into the afternoon and for us here in the evening. The, uh, and, and I'd like to thank everybody first up for, A, you're coming, right? Nine tenths of life is showing up and you're here. And we're here and, and we think this is the start of a great adventure. And we're glad you're here with us because without you all, this adventure doesn't happen. And down the road, if we help people to stop smoking, we've done a pretty good job starting today. Cool. Thoughts, questions? Three questions here in Bridgeport. We've got any questions from around the country here. I want to need to hear and see, hear things from, uh, from folks there. Terrific. Here in Bridgeport, we've got uh, Aaron. How do you find the hospital's variability in participation in this program? Is that part of the solicitation? So the question is, how do, you find, how do, how do we find the hospitals? past tense, and then how in future, I will add to that, do we find the, um, the hospitals to join us still, right? Um, 
quite frankly, emergency medicine is a small sorority and fraternity. Um, in, in many ways, we know each other well. Um, and if we don't know somebody at a hospital, if I don't know somebody at a hospital, I know somebody who knows somebody at a hospital. So in a way, this is about engaging the sorority and fraternity of, of emergency medicine. And that's what we did, right? We called lots of different places, lots and lots of places. I, I was on that cell phone, you know, seemed like 24-7 for a while. Um, and, and the hospitals that you see on that slide before, all of them who are part of NARAP right now, they saw the message, right? They said, wow, this could be pretty good. But more than that, they said this could be in our self-interest because it's going to advance the research outside of NARAP that we do within our institution, right? So this is not just about doing a NARAP study. This is about advancing research at each of the NARAP institutions. Now, some have not done major research up to this point. Maybe this is an impetus to do that. Maybe it's just they're going to be NARAP and be part of this because they see the idea about how this can change how we do primary health care. They can see how many people can be helped. And not for nothing, it doesn't cost a lot of money. Right? In fact, you get paid in some commodity other than money. Okay? So that's the what's. <clears throat> that's the history part. The next part of this is, this is an ever-expanding process, right? So other institutions that would like to, colleges that contact me, I was on the phone actually on Friday uh, talking to a college that would like to start this uh, at their home hospital, and they're going to be the impetus. It could be a hospital that says, wow, you know, I heard about this. It's been written up in various journals. Some see it on, some heard it on NPR. It's on NPR one time. We had some uh, publicity about it. Uh, it's been in the New York Times, the Boston Globe. The, um, they see the message. They say, wow, that's great. Yeah, this could help with, the, with their own patients, and it can help with their own research. So that's future stuff. Um, we see this as, um, in a way, think of it as, um, as kind of a spider web, right? You have institutions that are all part of NARAP, but may have little pieces of their own. Maybe there's an, there are hospitals that want to do an ankle study, but they don't want to do an ankle study that enrolls 100 participants in the study and, and work hard to do that over a year. They want to enroll 1,000. Well, get a couple of three, four, five, six, ten, maybe all NARAP institutions. Now you get the study done real fast, right? So the idea is that this is an ever-expanding piece. Again, I think I've said this, and I'll just use the, the analogy again. Um, we want it to be that when you go to an emergency department, it's when thir within 30 miles of a college, that as people want to go to medical school, five, ten years from now, that there's going to be a green shirt that's going to walk in and say, hi, my name's Keith Bradley. I'm the Emergency Medicine Research Associate, blah, blah, blah. Ask you about colorectal cancer screening. Ask you about whatever other study they're doing. And then at the end, as we do here at St. Vincent's, go, the research is over. Now we're going to do service. May I ask you about, do you smoke? Because based on the work that you did. So think about this as kind of a, you know, a, there's, there's a big picture here that you are at the very center of, center of the big bang, if you will. Great question. Thanks, Aaron. Another question. question. <laughs> Stephanie? Yes. Do we have anything from uh, other places? No. No. Shyness in the rest of NARAP. We have shyness. Oh my. Got to be another. Well, now we get now it's up to it's up to St. Vincent's. No, Mike, you can't ask a question. You've already had your chance. Another question. Mike's one of our chief research associates here at uh, for those of you who are elsewhere. It's one of our chief RAs, chief RA for database here. It's going to be a long time before Ryan King gets to get on the. the... Okay, we're good. <laughs>